You know, it's interesting, uh, the perceptions that people have of watercolor. Um, we tend to think of it as a medium that children use when they first start painting. So it's a, a medium uh, for childhood use. Uh, a lot of artists think of it as, uh, and refer to it as the medium of the masters uh, because they perceive it as being such a difficult medium. Uh, yes, it has its challenges, but uh, those are based on limitations, and each media has its own limitations that uh, limit what a person can do, but those limitations can also be used to create great beauty. Um, it's also interesting to me how uh, people tend to think of watercolor as a second-class medium to oil, that oil painting is the most important medium. And it's true that many of the most important works in Western civilization have been painted in oil, but uh, watercolor is actually a far more permanent medium than oil. Uh, the oldest oils in the world uh, are probably not much over 600 years old. And there are watercolors, which uh, painted by the Egyptians on papyrus are over 3,000 years old and are still as bright and fresh as the day they are painted. So watercolor, you know, is a very permanent medium. Um, and it, uh, it just has sort of suffered from uh, people's opinions. I, I think part of it comes from the... Uh, establishment of art museums in Europe. In the 17th century, uh, a group of uh, curators of different museums all agreed that since watercolor was generally painted on paper, that it should be grouped with drawings, which are ge then generally considered to be preliminary studies for oil paintings. So way back in the 1700s, uh, the decision was made that Watercolor would always be uh, relegated to uh, a sketching or a preliminary media. And that may be where uh, this attitude of uh, watercolor being secondary to oil comes from historically. Today I would like to talk to you about using uh, some basic materials with watercolor and the tools you should have with you when you uh, go about starting to paint in watercolor. Basically, you should have, uh, of course, watercolor paper. Um, and, I, and I really feel that um, it's important to have good watercolor paper to paint on when you start out because uh, it actually is easier to pa uh, paint on than uh, some other uh, brands, uh, cheaper brands. I think that, you know, whatever um, kind of watercolor kit you have to hold your watercolor paint and mix uh, is up to you. Um, uh, an element that uh, I use in my classes a great deal is a cellulose sponge. And this cellulose sponge has been dipped in water and then wrung out. So it is very, very, very absorbent. And this is, uh, I find, very good for controlling how much water is in the brush, how much water is on the palette, and how much water is on the uh, watercolor paper itself. So it gives a person a lot more control than uh, not having it. Of course, some kind of a container to hold water and uh, brushes. I have two sizes here, uh, a medium sharp uh, brush and a large sharp pointed brush, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. And I also like to have a box of Kleenex nearby. Uh, this is uh, for uh, also for helping to control how much water I'm working with. It can be used as a, uh, a texturing tool and uh, it's just very very handy all the way around. Now before you start to paint uh, I, it's very important if you're using dry paint to add a little water to your palette to let those paints soak up and start to soften. Um, like so I'll add a brush full on each one and depending on the paint you're working with and the palette uh, I might let it sit for 10 minutes or 15 minutes before I start to paint. There's several reasons for this. One is you have that beautiful point on the brush 
and you don't want to be rubbing the tip of that brush into the paint trying to get enough paint to paint with. So if you give the paint a chance to soften, you'll be, you'll be working uh, and putting much less uh, friction or stress on the end of the brush. Now, if you're in a hurry and you want the paint to be uh, wet faster, then what actually works quite well is an oil painting brush with the stiff white uh, hog's hair bristles. And with a brush like this, you can sit here and you can rub into the paint and soften it very rapidly like that. Rinse it, go to the next one, and again, use the stiff, heavy-duty brush to soften the paint faster and go through your entire set in this manner so that when you're finished in a minute or two, you'll be ready to paint uh, without damaging your nice, high-quality uh, and beautiful watercolor brushes. Now, another thing that uh, you can think about is if your palette needs to be cleaned. Rex Brandt said one time that uh, he always waited until just before he painted to clean his palette. And prior to that, I'd always cleaned it when I was done painting. He said it was much easier to clean your palette if you waited until just before you were ready to paint. And at first I thought, no way, how could that be possible? But since that time, I've discovered that sure enough, I take what a Kleenex and rub up or rub out the paint and the palette, it comes right off. And it's actually much less messier and much faster than uh, doing it at the end of the painting session. So you can, you can think about uh, that as a, as a principle. I'd like to talk a little bit about the colors that you use and how you lay them out on a palette. Each artist develops their own preferred colors with a lot of use over many years. Uh, these are colors that I have come to like to work with, and, and I also like the way they mix together, so that's part of the reason that I enjoy them. I also seem to be able to paint almost anything I want, from flowers to landscapes to buildings to portraits. So. It, it has become a practical uh, arrangement for me. Uh, and the colors you see here are, this, are this, is a, this is a palette that I have set up for travel so I can carry it with me wherever I go. The colors here are based on the color wheel palette, which I invented 30 years ago. And the idea here is that your pigments are arranged like a color wheel so that when you look at the palette, you're seeing a color wheel, which helps you Think about color theory while you're mixing. So, the colors here. The first color is Camion Yellow Lemon. I like Camion Yellow Lemon because it seems to be the brightest of all the Camion Yellows. And with that, I, I have a Camion Yellow Deep. So between these two colors, I can, I can mix a whole range of the other Camion colors that are commonly used by just small amounts of one into the other. The next color is uh, Naples Yellow, which is a uh, rather opaque uh, watercolor paint, which uh, really simulates sunlight in painting, so I find it very beautiful, and I like the opacity sometimes added to other pigments. Next to that is Raw Sienna. I used Yellow Ochre for many years, but now I've transitioned over into raw sienna because it's a little darker in value. It's exactly the same color, just a step down in value, which I prefer because of the little greater value range. Next to that is burnt umber, which is the darkest brown that I have on my palette. It's also actually very close to a true yellow, which we will discuss later on. Uh, so it gives me the range of color uh, from of yellows from a very light value down to a very dark value. Next to that is Camium Orange, a beautiful, rich uh, color. And after that is Burnt Sienna, which is actually a grayer red orange. So, and as you probably know, uh, a workhorse color that almost everybody has on their palette. 
Next to that is cadmium uh, red medium, which is the closest you have to a true spectrum red. So it's a dark, true red that's not too warm and not too cold. Next to that, I have a cadmium red light, of course, which is a, a wonderful mixing red and uh, very helpful for adding warmth to almost any mixture. Next color is uh, opera, which is a very, very powerful cold pink, which uh, comes into play at times. Next to that is a permanent alizarin crimson or permanent rose. I use them interchangeably, uh, a dark transparent red, uh, beautiful for mixing. Next to that, I have a uh, watercolor white. It's either a titanium or a zinc uh, a watercolor white. Uh, and I like having that on my palette. Uh, I know a lot of artists don't use it, but uh, when you look at the palettes of John Singer Sargent and Winslow Homer and a number of uh, the most famous watercolor paintings from the 19th into the early 20th century, they almost all had white on their palettes. So I don't think there's any problem with having a white on your palette. The next color here is a deep violet. I make my violet by mixing ultramarine blue and the permanent rose. The reason I do that is because then this color is made up of colors that are already on my palette and it's very transparent and it mixes beautifully with the other colors. It has a very nice relationship with the other colors in mixing so I don't have to fight it when I want a dark purple. Next color is cobalt violet which is of course uh, a beautiful uh, 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 kind of a rosy uh, lavender type color. Next to that, I have two wells of ultramarine because, again, it's a workhorse color and I tend to use a lot of it, so I actually just have two wells full of that. Uh, then cobalt violet, then cerulean blue. Gives me three strong, beautiful blues to work with. Next to that, I have a cobalt green. And this is another um, specialty color that uh, when I want a really strong, beautiful aqua color that will push my palette into that color range. I can't quite reach it with my other colors, so that gives me that full range of that particular color. Next to that is Hooker's Green Light, and Hooker's Green Light with Ultramarine added to it. So to get a darker green here, I'm using Ultramarine again, which is a very friendly color. Um, and I get a dark green that mixes beautifully with all the other colors and I don't have to fight it as I'm painting, so I just mix my own. Next to that is a, uh, a yellow, a phthalo yellow green, which of course uh, gives you that beautiful uh, grassy uh, spring uh, leaf greens without having to mix. It just gets you into that range very, very quickly. So I like having that on my palette. And at the end, I have two blacks. Uh, both of these blacks are, again, made from mixing ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And just varying the amount of the two colors. If there's more brown, I end up with a warm black. And if there's more blue, I end up with a cold black. Now, these are therefore pigmented blacks that uh, again mix beautifully with the other colors and they don't have the um, stronger graying aspect of a true black pigment which generally are made from charcoal something has been burned and then ground up to make the pigment and they and then a true black will have kind of a sooty graying effect on any color that you work with it now sometimes you want that effect sometimes you want a true black uh, if you're painting a twilight scene, or maybe you're painting a tree that's been burned and you want that kind of charcoal quality uh, in your blacks, well then a true black would be appropriate there. So that's basically the layout of uh, uh, this particular palette.
All right, I'd also like to talk about how you lay out your sponge, your water, and your palette. Uh, for me, I've found it very efficient to have the water and the sponge and my palette sort of in a triangle so I can reach each of them very quickly in either direction so that when I'm taking a collar and laying it down, I can dry it quickly or I can add water to it or add more water or take water out so that this triangle kind of a pattern is works very efficiently for me and it seems to work very efficiently for my students as well. I'd like to talk about now one of the most fundamental basic washes that we use in watercolor and a great one to start with and that is a flat wash. Now I'm going to I'm going to actually prop my watercolor block up a little bit so in the back so that it will be at a slight angle. So I have this little uh, canvas bag. I'm going to drop back here. It could be um, a shoe or uh, a book or anything else that you have around to lift it up a couple inches to get a little bit of a slope on it. And I'm going to draw a little rectangle here on the paper and so I'm going to choose just one color to start with and so in this case burnt sienna. Now I do want to mix it on the palette fairly well. I don't want to leave it on the palette for too long because the paint will settle and uh, to the bottom and the water will, of course will be on top and you want it to be as fully immersed as possible. So make sure it's well mixed. Sometimes there'll be little bits of the paint that get uh, stuck in the brush. So I'm sitting here and I'm spinning the brush to make sure that I'm loosening all of those and dissolving them. So I'll have a nice, even, flat, uh, clean uh, pool of paint to work from. Now, the way that I start this is I'm going to go to the top of this block uh, so that I've drawn here and I'm going to put a nice wash of that burnt sienna down on the top and you'll see that a because of the angle and uh, gravity the paint will tend to flow down toward the bottom and when you do a flat wash like this you don't want to stop at any point and go answer the phone or get a cup of coffee or anything like that because uh, if you wait too long the paint will will develop uh, little edges where it starts to set into the paper and dry. Now you can see that I'm keeping the brush down at the bottom here where uh, the paint is flowing kind of down towards the bottom. I can take my time, but I want to be pretty deliberate. Just watch the surface. If I miss a little bit, like right there, while I'm there, go back and kind of Fill that in while I'm in that area. And I'm going to bring this, continue to bring it down. keeping it, in this case, sort of within the confines of this shape that I drew.
So when I get to the bottom of the shape that I've just defined, you see there'll still be that little bead of paint. What I want to do is to lay the paper down flat, dry the brush on the sponge, and then use the brush like a sharp little sponge itself to lift up the excess water. And usually just lifting that little bit will um, take enough of it away that it won't wash back into the wash that you have and it'll, it'll uh, uh, finish nice and evenly. Now, you can see here that there's a little bit of unevenness and irregularity. To me, that's fine because we're doing something that's handmade. So that it shows the process of being done by hand, to me, can be part of the beauty of, um, of a hand-painted wash. So I don't really concern myself with the fact that it's a little irregular. If that's something that concerns me, I might do something like this. Basically, the same shape now. And I'm going to very lightly now add some clear water over the surface. And I have a little bit of the burnt sienna in the water so you can kind of see the water on the surface. I'm going to use the brush, I'm going to dry the brush on the sponge, and then I'm going to eliminate or lift most of that water off, place it back on the sponge, do it a couple times, get it very thin, very transparent. It doesn't hurt to wait a few minutes when you're doing this, give it a little more time. And now I'm going to lay another wash, but because it's already wet, it's going to move a lot faster. But that's okay. I know that from experience. So I'm basically, I won't have that, that bead that we had before. See, this is going to lay down. And you can see that it will be more even um, than the first one. Again, if there's a bee that starts to form at the bottom, I can dry the brush on this on the cellulose sponge, take the tip and use it like a very sharp sponge to take a little bit of it off the bottom and then lay it flat. I uh, allow that to dry. Now, sometimes if you're uh, in inside, if you have a hair dryer, you can speed dry these things and make them dry much faster. Um, obviously, if I want a lighter version of that color, Take the same, basically make the same kind of a shape here. And with the color on my palette, now I'm going to add more water to that. And with more water, I will get a lighter color. So it will basically be diluted. So here you can see I've added a lot of water to the top of this rectangle. Come back and start working, tipping the paper. Come back, start taking that lighter wash, laying it down. See the bead forming, keep the brush down in the bead. Again, being deliberate, not taking my mind off of it, but watching what I'm doing, sort of just paying attention and being right there uh, where that edge of that shape is starting to develop. Dry 
dropping it down, sort of back and forth. You can see I have enough paint there. I don't need to go back to my well on my palette. Just take that bead and work that down. Gravity is pulling the paint down to the bottom and it's leaving a very smooth wash, very smooth and very transparent wash behind it. Now I have enough paint here in the bead, I really don't have to go back to my palette. I can just work that bead right down to the bottom. Again, not hurrying, just taking my time. Bringing it down, drying the brush on the sponge, using the brush like a sponge to lift that excess water off. You can see how it lifts it right up. And then when it looks like it's uh, kind of uh, finished to your satisfaction, then you lay it flat so the bead doesn't continue to form at the bottom. And depending on what kind of weather you have and the humidity, uh, it will dry faster or slower, just depending on the uh, uh, normal variations in uh, humidity and temperature and any kind of wind or breeze you might have. So here now we can see these three approaches to a flat wash. Now, watercolor is amazingly transparent. It's called transparent watercolor. And we tried an experiment in one of my classes one time, and we put about 60, we, we put a mark on a piece of paper, and we put about 60 coats of paint at about this degree of um, transparency over that mark. And after 60 layers, you can still see the mark underneath. So it, it stayed transparent through 60 applications of paint like this. So um, it is very transparent. Um, also, if you want to make something darker uh, by going over it a second time, so I can take my burnt sienna here again, put the paper up on the little canvas bag back there, mix up a bunch of paint again, start at the top, and lay another wash over the first. And what you'll see is that the second wash will actually go down easier than the first uh, because it's uh, the, the paint underneath is filling up some of the pores of the paper, so the paper is not quite as absorbent. So you're laying the paint on top of paint, so it will actually go a little easier uh, the second time. And you can see here that I'm getting a much richer, stronger wash, flat wash of burnt sienna the second time around. Still have that bead, still going slowly enough to sort of cover everything and have the edges as finished as I want them. The nice thing about putting a wash the second time over your first wash is that it evens out what you did the first time. So the irregularities that we had initially are still kind of there, but they almost disappear. Now at the bottom again, taking the excess paint off the brush on the damp sponge using the sponge to lift the excess off. Let it kind of settle and then lay the um, paper back down flat to dry. And you can see now that I've the, the value or the darkness of this rectangle was almost the same as this. And you can see how much darker I've made it the second time. Now sometimes when people are first 
learning to work with watercolor, they have a hard time getting rich, stronger colors in their paintings. They're just a little shy. Uh, they use a little too much water. And so if we, if I encourage them to put a second wash over their first wash, oftentimes they'll start to get much stronger, richer color, which is what they want. And they can't quite figure out how to do it without doing this a few times. Now, once you have uh, practiced some uh, flat washes, simple rectangles, and got a feel for how the paint behaves uh, under the influence of gravity and the bead and keeping the brush in the bead and all of that, um, what I usually have my students do is um, do flat washes on more complicated shapes. So I'll have them draw uh, numbers and letters and then fill those in with flat washes. So I might do a shape like a kind of a big, fat three. And then I will take a collar, in this case, it's a cobalt blue, nice, beautiful, slightly warm blue, very transparent, very beautiful to paint with. And one of the things that I get my students to do is to not just have the block on the table or tilt it up, but to be willing to pick it up and move it a little bit. So I'm actually going to tip the block so that as I lay this wash, the bead will actually flow toward the bottom, which I will change as it moves around. Now I've changed the direction so that it's coming down this way. Changed again here. This now is more the shape. Uh, quite a bit of it here will just be going down the page so I can hold it now for a moment like so. Again, taking my time, not going too fast. Working in the bead, keeping the tip of the brush in the bead filling as I go, working it across, evening it to a degree. Now I can take the brush and paint along the edges very carefully and then carry the bead down in between. As long as I do it quickly, uh, it won't show. Now I'm turning the whole block again here. see that I can work that wash around all the way to the end by just making sure it's always pulling down towards gravity. I'm going to take the brush and dry it and then while it's been dried on the sponge lift the excess off. It will then flow into that corner and even out and I will have a nice even wash all the way through. So I've laid a flat wash through a much more complicated shape than um, I had originally. That was just the rectangles. And then after my students have done uh, three, four, five of these uh, numbers and letters, I will sometimes ask them to do something far more complicated. And I will get them to draw something that actually is a more complicated shape because you never know what kind of a shape you're going to create for yourself in your drawing that you may want to lay a flat wash through. So what I've done now is I've 
draw on an even more complicated shape. And I've gone to that purple that I mixed from ultramarine and alizarin or permanent rose and have a nice quantity of it up here. And I have to be a little, I even pay a little more attention and be a little uh, uh, quicker with the brush and pay a little more attention. I'm right-handed, so I'll start on the left here. And I'll start to bring this down. But then I'll jump over and do it here too. And so I'll sort of be doing two at the same time. Bring that across. Bring that bead over, carry it down. Comes down to the bottom here. This point, I want to turn it. You can see that the bead then coalesces on this edge down here to the right, start to work this down. And I think this actually gives a person some practice in some more complicated shapes like you might actually encounter when painting uh, something totally innocent. It might be something you think is totally innocent and you get into it and all of a sudden you have this pretty complicated flat wash that's working through the shape or a combination of shapes and you have to sort of be on your game and paying attention to what you're doing to accomplish that flat wash. Here, tilt it back up, bring this down. Being very gentle on the edges, making those nice and perfect now. You will see artists actually sometimes painting flat washes around branches in a tree. And the negative shapes in a tree can be very complex and they'll actually, or maybe a bouquet of flowers, and they'll just decide, they'll decide late in the game what color they want in the background. And so they'll have to put the background in last, and they'll put this very complicated flat wash around flowers, and between leaves, and, or between branches, and they'll pull it off. They'll end up with a very beautiful flat wash in the background, but you sort of uh, wonder how, how difficult it was for them to, to do those very complicated um, flat washes behind objects they'd already painted in. So anyway, uh, this is kind of a start. You could do a series of these in, in increasing difficulty, and that would give you some real world kind of experience with using flat washes in a variety of situations.